and this is the first green room of our, our limited bandwidth podcast. Um, it is very green, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a nice day. We, nice didn't, day to be outside. we didn't think about that really, did we? <laughs> Mostly away from screens as well. So our, our first episode that we released last week of the podcast uh, featured Chris Cleverly, uh, singer-songwriter. Uh, he's just releasing an album. And yeah, this was just a bit of a chance to reflect on some of the stuff that you brought up because it was a really, it was a fascinating conversation because we're taking these first steps trying to to figure out what other musicians are doing as well before we we meet our specialists a little bit later on. Yeah, I mean the premise of the uh, the first episode there with Chris was was largely on how do you make a connection with your audience or with with other people who want to engage with you um, as a human using these kind of digital platforms, which are now the core of what we do as musicians to engage and to promote and to market and, and all of this, um, and how. What came across to, for me was how he did that in an authentic way that yeah. was part of his creative process, um, and it was something that that he sort of built into you know when he writes a song mm-hmm. he, he might record something for for use later on and, yeah. and sort of creating that sort of content as he goes rather than having to go back and and create it all from scratch which yeah, it does so seem a bit backward it. now doesn't it I mean it definitely touched on that idea um, like social media platforms are meant to be social things they're meant to be ways Mm -hmm. of connecting with your friends uh sharing your holiday photos and opinions and news pieces whatever but you know we've all kind of co-opted them as marketing tools which they're not built for really they've been adapted but they're not built for no that's a really he was bringing the social back or bringing (laughs) like a bit of his own voice is that a new hashtag (laughs) bring the social back oh no where's the thing because we were saying like chris was talking to us about this idea that likes and like view counts on things we sort of know from things like facebook that it's not always actually accurate a view count can mean that they saw your video for like what two seconds three seconds maybe and it doesn't really give an accurate representation of the quality of no you know what some, somebody that that watched your video your new single official video or something but but they they don't tend to you know engage in the way that the social media platforms like no like you know giving it a thumbs up or commenting on it or something like that That doesn't mean that they didn't really enjoy it and take something away from it and share it with their friends just you know visibly sharing like this is the kind of thing we would do if we were sharing something like oh have you heard this thing i'll play it for you (laughs) i've not shared it or anything like that so on that side of things it's quite encouraging isn't it because there's loads of stuff that happens behind the scenes that when you look at the stats on these sorts of things it does just doesn't come up no Uh, but that that idea that if you're trying to make a proper connection as an artist, if you're just chasing that end thing, that number, on whatever platform it is, likes and things, it's probably better to focus on putting out a quality bit of content first, mm. so that whatever that engagement is, they're engaging with your artistic voice properly on the platform somewhere. That was something that, that, that Chris mentioned yeah. that, was, that really came across to me was, you know, concentrate on the substance of what you're making yep. and, and adapt that into the content rather than focusing on creating the content as, as the primary and then everything else is secondary. It's so easy to fall into that trap yeah. when you've got, you're trying to be organized and you're trying to schedule your posts and things and you think, oh, okay, I need some content for this. The easiest way is just to make it. Yeah, and it's, I mean, we've <laughs> used this not. word when we've been talking about stuff before, but it feels really vacuous because instead of being creative, I then feel like I'm just doing an admin task and I'm just chasing like, yeah, yeah. Uh, what do I roughly need to get into this post and it's and then it gets on top of you yeah. and limits your bandwidth <laughs> and, and you feel the need to recharge and refresh yeah. and it's just a vicious cycle isn't it well, I, I, it's part of that thing if you want to do it you won't feel like it's a chore and it won't be quite as fatiguing mm. maybe that's a positive mindset yeah. you've got yeah, to yeah. you've got to channel that and, and structure yourself so that that's the way that you think about it and that's the way it manifests ultimately yeah. but I've never really thought I don't know why I've just never thought about bringing that kind of creative voice into that space in that way so it's actually it's a creative endeavor so you're doing what you're meant to be doing as a musician as a writer yeah I mean it's certainly not not easy is it I mean with with the whole digital marketing side of things now as the core of of pretty much everything you do as a musician when you you know releasing some music or something like that and and something else that Chris mentioned was the the fact that um, if you put some money behind that, that's that's in addition to maybe the more traditional PR stuff that you yeah, would do in it. terms of like 
reviews, newspaper yeah. reviews, all that, that kind of, of print thing. side of things. Is, radio play. Yeah, yeah. Print <laughs> radio. It's already standard. It's stuff we've sort of been conscious of. Like we've been in different groups, but like through our careers with different different bands. But even that's diminishing. And you're probably paying someone the same amount of money to get you on. Yeah. Like there's half the number of like niche radio stations that are kind of looking at our corner of music. Mm. Um, you know, publications have definitely dropped considerably. Everyone wants to get in there. So there's less space for you all to talk. So you're paying the same amount to kind of <laughs> maybe achieve half as much on that front. And then you're having to think, now I have to be a digital marketer as well, or I yeah. need to hire someone, yeah. and I'm spending time or money doing it. The difficult bit is is restructuring that marketing plan with no data, yeah. because yeah. you can look at somebody else's data or sort of you know market trends or whatever, but none of it's strictly relevant to you. Nope. And unless you've you've been through that process before, trialed uh, a digital marketing person and a traditional PR person, and sort of learnt from from that creative cycle yep. from last year or something where things have still changed again <laughs> so it's it's never exactly you know you, there's no guarantees are there that's it's so difficult it is actually bringing that up the creative cycle thing i think is valid as well because mm. what i found like, a big takeaway for me was this idea as chris said that if you're in a release cycle you sort of do need to be present you need to be preparing that content and and you can do that with the schedule you can say to yourself, you know, I'm going to do X number of things during the week. But when you're outside of the release cycle, yeah. it's absolutely valid and it's not going to damage what you're doing, especially from his perspective. To switch off. Mm. Don't have the apps on your phone. I think a like lot of people kind of will take solace and a lot of comfort in that yeah. because there is a lot of, I won't say pressure, but it's kind of... Um, Some of it's self-made, I think. Yeah. But, but this drive for content creation, it is there. There is a pressure. Yeah, I think I think lots of people expect you. There's an expectation to be yeah. on it all the time. Yeah. And and that's not necessarily true. No. I think that's something that's self-generated. That you yeah. feel like there's an expectation to be glued to your phone and reply to every comment as it comes up. And to... we've had it like absolutely <laughs> this idea that like oh we're not touring at this point in the year. We're yeah. kind of writing. So how do we tell people we still exist? Like panicking that just because <laughs> yeah. we've, we've not had something out for like two weeks that everyone's going to be like, well, they vanished. Um, <laughs> but then mm. that happens at the top with like big pop artists. Yeah, exactly. You get that thing like, oh it's gosh, natural. she's not released an album for ages or he's not been writing. No, but then you've got the whole comeback thing, haven't you? Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, I'd kind of not, not forgotten about them. But yeah. Like it surprises me when something new comes out and it's like, oh, this is so fresh again. And they, that. they get that sort of rejuvenation which if you're there all the time putting out sort of mediocre content at the expense of you know your next album or something yeah but hopefully like actually it's kind of a bad thing as well if everything <laughs> is that saturated that you can disappear for a couple of months maybe maybe like if we were writing mm. we wouldn't really have to be present on social media as much because we're not releasing something that's our time to be creative well that opens up no one's whole... gonna know because they're just <laughs> flooded with stuff all the time yeah I mean I, yeah maybe something that that needs to have a comeback is like the, the whole writing retreat ethos yeah. of like, yeah, spending a couple of weeks in a cabin in the woods. Sounds and... nice. <laughs> you bring I the think, snacks. Yeah. <laughs> wouldn't take much convincing, would it? No, no, it really wouldn't for me. But like previously, I wouldn't have thought like until we were speaking to Chris that actually maybe we can do that because mm. I'd just be panicking about the content creation because it's become so present for us. Like, yeah. We're emerging artists, we need to sell tickets. We want to support promoters that are putting on our gigs. So we absolutely want to kind of go, mm. here's some content, you can share this, you know, <laughs> we, we personalize this for you because hopefully your audience will like this and we want them to come and enjoy this time with us. Yeah. And you become hyper fixated, or I have, certainly. I know, yeah. I have, <laughs> I have become the obsessive on that front, partly why the podcast has come about. Well, yeah, there's, there's so many things to sort of dig into and yeah. there are so many other questions that I wish we had time to ask. Chris yeah in in the last episode episode one um, like it's clearly been something that he's thought about yeah to quite a degree yeah I, absolutely having the scheduling stuff his advice is on point I think it's it's stuff that's saved us so far mm. as well and there's there's things I would take away it's from difficult that. to be organized but it's worth it I yeah. think yeah, yeah in the long run it makes things so much easier and you're not redoing things either no and then your genuine artistic voice is available. Mm. So when someone does stumble on your stuff and actually wants to spend some time there. It's authentic. Yeah. They can make a genuine connection with what you're creating. Mm. And it's not just because you've gone, what's the bare minimum? Doors open at seven, here's the venue. 
come along. <laughs> like there's actually a chance to get a little bit involved with that person and feel like you know them a little bit. Exactly. Which is important. Yeah. I think engagement is driven by like knowing people. There are musicians who I absolutely adore as people mm. and that opens the door for me to be like, of course I want to support your stuff. Yeah. You're great people and oh my God, you create amazing stuff too. Yeah. And it goes both ways. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's so much to dig into. If, if too you haven't, much. If you haven't caught it already, uh, episode one is up now on, on our website, on Spotify, on all the major podcasting platforms. And next week, uh, we are cracking on with episode two. Yeah, yeah. We've got uh, John Parker. Another special guest, another musician. Um, this one is a, a double bassist who's very prevalent on the, the acoustic folk scene in the UK, um, and he's also a session player as well. I yeah, think you've had the amazing pr- session privilege player. of playing with him a couple of oh, times, yes. now, haven't you? Oh, I've learned so. M- I've learned musically so much from him, but um, he's a really philosophical chap, and he's really thoughtful and just a joy to be around. So, mm. yeah, yeah. If you're interested in sort of how how the digital platforms and social media have evolved over time that's going to be a good one to catch up on as well because he's got a lot of great insights on that yeah i mean he's someone who had some early kind of viral success when it's like all of this stuff was in its infancy like mm. i think myspace was just having its kind of eclipse moment i when, remember that yeah <laughs> oh yeah all that html awesome well thank you very much for, for catching up on the green room episode uh, for episode one um we've been the last inklings and hope to see you soon mm.